Okay, good afternoon, good evening, whatever, wherever it is, wherever you are. It's about 4.30 in the afternoon here in Providence. And I'm um, going to continue, got to keep going because this story is so much to learn in every single week's Torah reading. This Torah reading is called Pashat Vayigash. Last week, if you remember, if you were following last week's story, uh, Joseph having been thrown into the pit, get sold to the Ishmaelite to get sold several times. He comes down to Egypt. Um, he rises up. He's in the house of Potiphar. He is seduced by Potiphar's wife. Just quick recap. Um, and then after he resists her seductions and her temptations, then he he is accused of um, accost accosting her. And in response, he get thrown into jail. He's in jail for many years. He meets the butler and the baker. It's a very, it's a very famous story from uh, Joseph and his maid is in Technicolor's Junior but it's in the Torah. He has the butler and baker in his jail along with him. They have dreams that are unsettled by their dreams. Joseph interprets the dreams with God's help and he predicts that the cupbearer, the butler, will be re returned to service to Pharaoh, which he is. And he says to the, the cupbearer, remember me when you leave when you leave, when you, when you, when you go back out into the service of Pharaoh, um, for asking, we've talked about this for two extra years, he stays in jail. The cupbearer remembers him when Pharaoh is having dreams. This was last week's Torah portion. Pharaoh has these dreams. He doesn't know what to do. He's very unsettled about these dreams. And the cupbearer remembers this lad, this Ivri, this Jew, this Hebrew guy that was in jail. He gets pulled out of jail, dressed in finery, brought before the king, before Pharaoh, and he interprets Pharaoh's dreams. And along with the interpretation, he then offers advice as to what to do to store up for, during the seven years of um, abundance there's going to be in the land. There's going to be seven years where there's going to be bumper crops and there's going to be so much wealth in the land, but it's going to be followed by seven years of famine. And Joseph says to Pharaoh, appoint someone with wisdom and with understanding who can take care of the future by, by storing up and, and, and um planning now while we have abundance and as we know pharaoh appoints joseph joseph who was the the son of jacob the hebrew from the land of canaan who went through the downs and ups of being thrown into a pit and rising to high status in is in um, egyptian society gets thrown into the jail rises up again and he's now second in command to pharaoh he has a huge amount of power and during these years of plenty as he's storing up and he's planning and he literally he literally owns the whole the whole of of everything all the land all the people they sell everything as the years of famine progress i think we're in year 2 of the famine people are so needy of food that they sell everything to Joseph, who 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 uh, is second in command to Pharaoh, so essentially it's all owned everything, the land, the the people, essentially, and all the produce, all the fields, everything is now owned by Pharaoh. So Joseph's brothers, as we know, they're in Canaan, and the famine hits them. They don't have food. They don't know what to do, and they come down to Egypt, and um, they come and they stand before their brother. They don't know him to be their brother. He is Joseph and he is the viceroy. He has a new name. He's wearing different clothes. It's 22 years later. They don't recognize him. And uh, last week we had um, the incidents where they take the grain, they leave. And, um, and Joseph sets up a scenario whereby um, they, the brothers, start to undergo a process of going back to what they did, their role in selling Joseph, their role in the brotherhood, what, what, it, what it meant to their father to be mourning for all these years for this lost, loved son, Joseph. And um, through all of this week's story, last week's story, we have Joseph in this position of power, who's taking the brothers through various different um, uh, incidences and scenarios whereby they have a choice as to how they choose to act and what they choose to think. And essentially what's happening in the story is Joseph is setting everything up such that the brothers are able to, number one, put the dreams that Joseph had way back a few past years ago when he was having these dreams of the sheaves of corn 
of wheat, excuse me, the sheaves of wheat bowing down to his sheaf of wheat and the sun and the moon and the stars bowing down to his star, that this was a prophecy of what was going to happen. And now it's playing out. The brothers come and they're bowing down to Joseph. They don't know it's Joseph, but they're bowing down to him. And it's about food. They want food. And these stalks of wheat represent food. So we have this bowing down of the brothers coming to the viceroy of Egypt, who is Joseph, asking for food. That's a, that's a manifestation. That's a coming true of the dream, the prophecy dream that Joseph had a couple of couple of uh, couple of pastures ago like decades ago it's coming true now and um, in order for the rest of the dream to come to actualization the story has to play out so Joseph as many of the commentators tell us doesn't send word to his father he doesn't tell his father I'm Joseph I'm here I'm, I'm alive you know he doesn't say anything and there's a lot of conversation in the Torah in the commentaries as to why he doesn't send word to his father one of them one of the reasons why he doesn't say is because the dream has to play itself out he has to have the father come and bow down to him come 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 to come to Egypt and come and ask for food and at that point there there this is what happens this is what plays out in this week's Torah portion so so at the end of last week's Torah portion, we had the brothers, they came down for food a second time, and they came with Benjamin. Benjamin is the only full brother of Joseph. Joseph and Benjamin shared mother Rachel. Rachel was their mother. The other brothers had different mothers. So the only full brother of Joseph is Benjamin. And as we know, their mother Rachel was the beloved wife of their father Jacob and there was back in the in the in the days you know decades ago when there was this jealousy and there was this hatred towards the children towards Joseph because of the coat that he was given by his father by the way his father um, was 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 very obviously treating Joseph with great favoritism there was jealousy and hatred that was engendered in the other brothers and uh, they also understood or felt or, 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 or came to their own understanding that Joseph was after the, uh, the kingship. He was after a, a, um, a role of leadership. But they, they felt that he didn't deserve it because he was not the firstborn of the father J Jacob. The firstborn of the father Jacob was Reuben, was Reuben as we know. And so in their mind, they had it all worked out that Joseph was pursuant of a leadership role that he was not entitled to. And so that was another reason why they felt it was um, uh, OK for them or they, they, they uh, felt, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They felt that they, it was OK for them to, quote unquote, get rid of Joseph. Originally, they were going to kill him. And as you remember, they didn't kill him. Reuven said, don't kill him, throw him into the pit. And it's... And it's Shimon that takes him. Uh, Shimon that takes him out of the pit, and Judah who sells him. And so now we have at the at the end of last week's Torah portion, Jake, jo Benjamin has come down to Egypt. They've met with Joseph. They've ate. They actually ate a meal with Joseph, and Joseph gives them all the food to take back to their father. And they all leave in their sacks of food. They have. Um, food, obviously, and they have money returned to them, but they also have the silver goblet, this special silver goblet that belonged to Joseph, and he planted it. It was a, it was a ruse. It was a plant, and jo Joseph plants it in the sack of food, along with the money returned, in the sack of Benjamin. As they're leaving Egypt, Joseph sends his soldiers, whoever, to go and stop them and say and, and accuse them of stealing his goblet, and whoever's sack the goblet is in, then that person will be a slave to will be a slave to Joseph. So they so they they catch up with the brothers. The brothers are leaving, and they stop them and they say, you know, we're going to uh, we're going to search the sacks. They search the sacks, and as you remember, the end of last week's pasha, they find the goblet, and it's in the sack of Benjamin. And as we remember from last week, Benjamin was this now beloved son, the only beloved son left in Jacob's life of his beloved Rachel. And he, and, and he didn't want to send Benjamin down with the other brothers to get food. He was so scared that something would happen to Benjamin. And Judah says, don't worry, dad, you know, I'll take, I'll be responsibility. I'll be the guarantor for, for, for Benjamin. I will guarantee you, I, on my life or my children's life will guarantee you that I will bring Benjamin back. And at this point we have this, the goblet found in the sack of, sack of Benjamin, what's going to happen. And the brothers come back down to Egypt now and they're confronting Joseph, the vizier of Egypt. What's going to happen? Is Benjamin going to be taken host uh, sl to slave to Pharaoh? What are the brothers going to do? And what's happening as all these 
incidents is playing out is that the same scenario is happening. We have the favored child of Rachel that Jacob loved the most. And, um, and um, are, are the brothers going to say, as they did with Joseph, let's just dispense with him. Let's be callous. We don't really care about him. We don't really care about what will happen to our father. We just, you know, care about what we care about. We're not going to care about this. But they do. And they've changed. They have done to Shuva. They have repented. They have understood what they did was wrong, that they shouldn't have sold Joseph. That was an, a heinous crime on their part. They did the wrong thing. Their father has been plunged into grief for the last 22 years. He had never given up hope that his son is still alive. And he's lived, they've lived with the mourning of their father for all these years. And now they're faced with a very similar situation. The, 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 the scenario of the favored son of Rachel being um, in a pl in a position of of a life a life threatening position, and what the father's what, being responsible for the father's emotional life. If something happens to Benjamin, what will happen to their father? So this is what's happening right now. Joseph is about to Joseph as the vizier, not known by the brothers to be the brother, is saying, "I'm going to take Benjamin. He's going to be a slave to me. I'm going to put him in jail." What's going to happen? Are the brothers going to say, "All right, that's the way it is," and walk away? What are they going to do? And this week's Torah portion begins with Judah, Yehuda. He approaches Joseph. He comes close to Joseph and he says, if you please, my Lord, may your servant speak a word in your Lord's ears and let not your anger flare up at your servant, for you are like Pharaoh. And then he goes on to offer himself instead of Benjamin. Don't let Benjamin, don't not let Benjamin go back to our father. And he's pleading and he steps forward. So I want to pick up on the first word of this week's Torah portion, Vayigash. Judah approaches him. He steps forward. He goes into the, into the sort of like closeness of relationship with the vizier. He's, he's, he's courageous. He's no longer passive. He's going to stand up and he's going to say, this is unjust. You can't do this. I will offer myself in his stead. And he comes close. So there's an idea of coming close. What does it mean to come close? So from this coming closeness comes our practice today. Our practice today, when we pray the standing prayer, the Amida, you may know that we take three steps forward. We go three steps forward and then we start this standing prayer. The pinnacle of our prayer service is the Amida and we, we take three steps forward. As, and then we enter into the prayer. And then at the end, we take three steps back. So these three steps comes from the three times in the Torah where somebody approaches somebody else to, with, a, with a plea, <laughs> with, a, with a coming closeness. Like in order to really be heard, in, or, in order to really have a relationship, I have to be close. I have to be close metaphorically. I have to be close physically. So it's interesting that we take three steps forward and we don't see God. We don't, you know, God's not sort of right there in front of us. But the, but the, um, what we're supposed to have in our mind is that we are stepping into the presence of God. It's a, it's a physical manifestation of our belief that we are stepping into a place where God is right there, right? God's right here and I'm stepping up and I'm stepping in and I'm coming close. It's a, it's a, it's using our whole body to do that, right? So it's a whole physical coming closeness, as opposed to what happened way back when they threw Joseph into the pit. If you remember, and we spoke about it back then, what happened back then was that they saw Joseph from afar. He was over there and they plotted to kill him. They plotted whatever they're plotting. Let's do something. Let's get rid of this dreamer. Let's kill this dreamer. They plot because they see him from afar. So do we see each other from afar? Do we see each other close up? How do we, how do we understand each other? And I think that this week's Torah portion is so filled with relationship building, with reconciliation between the brothers and Joseph. Joseph, who's on the outside of the brotherhood and, and how he, Joseph, who has every right to be angry. Joseph, who has every right to begrudge his brothers for throwing him into the pit, for selling him to slavery in Egypt. Oh my gosh. And he doesn't. He's not angry at his brothers at all. He doesn't, he doesn't blame them. He doesn't, I mean, he does say, you are responsible for my, for my coming down to Egypt. But he reframes the whole thing. Rabbi Sachs speaks a lot about reframing the past in order to have a different future. This is like an amazing point. Reframe the past in order to have a different future. Joseph, yes, he went through all that he went through, 
but he sees it as a divine plan that God orchestrated everything so that he would go through what he needed to go through to get to the place where he could sustain the whole world, where he is the dispenser of food and sustenance to the whole world and to his brothers, that he can be the one who does that. And that was that was the fruition of the prophecy he had in the dreams. And so Joseph has refra- reframed the last 22 years as saying, this is God's plan. That doesn't absolve you brothers for your own role in it, how it played out, but it was meant to be. This was supposed to happen. This was God's plan that I should be in this position. And I think that, you know, sometimes maybe we could internalize that in our own lives and say, well, I look back on things and they might have been really sad things. They might be really hard things. They might be really terrible things. Um, and how do we frame them? What's the what's the kind of like the lens with which we look back onto our pasts and say, I had to go through this or I had to miss on a small scale. You know, I had to miss that aeroplane or I had to, you know, meet this person or I had to have a flat tire or whatever it is so that this could play out so that I could meet this person so I could do this or so I could be in this position so I could build up this skill so I I lost my job so I could get that job or this door closed so that door could open like it's all how we see what happens to us is it is it a big picture is it all just random and accidental and coincidental and there's no there's no divine involvement and from this Torah portion and the way in which Joseph um, talks to his brothers after he reveals himself to them, which we get in this week's Torah portion. It's a, a huge climax of this story where Joseph reveals himself to his brothers, which we'll talk about in a minute. But he then says to them, I'm not angry with you. I'm not angry with you. Like, how crazy is that? Here we have um, Maimonides, the Rambam. He speaks about the emotion, every single character trait in our lexicon, we have a middle path and that's the path we're supposed to take, right? So don't be too kind and don't be too strict and don't be too this and don't be too that. The only one where there's no middle path is anger. Anger is never okay. It could be fake anger, like if if a child runs into the street and you, you know, you, you're angry at them because you're scared that they're going to get hurt so you can fake your anger. But we are told that anger is is like death. It's It takes you out of this world, that it's not something that we should ever, ever be so, so, so angry that we lose control. Um, and we'll talk about that later with the plagues. There was a, actually a, a, a medrash that speaks about the plague of frogs. You know, probably all know about the plague of frogs from the uh, Seder, um, that the frogs over overwhelmed the land of Egypt. And... Um, the Medrash teaches us that it was one, one huge, great big frog that came out of the river Nile. And the Egyptians were so scared of this frog that they took sticks and they smashed the head of this frog. And every time they smashed the head of the frog, then then the frog like split up into thousands of frogs and they kept hitting and they kept hitting and it created more and more and more and more frogs, but they got more and more and more angry that they couldn't contain themselves, even though it was irrational. Like they should have been hitting the frog because the hitting the frog created more frogs. They needed to be not hitting the frog. But because they were so angry, they lost touch of reality. They lost touch of themselves. They were not in control of themselves. And they kept hitting the frog and it kept creating more and more and more and more frogs. I think they came out of their mouths. But the point is, no anger. And here's Joseph. He's like almost beyond the human capacity to act. He's known as Joseph the Tzaddik, the righteous one. And one of the reasons why he's, because there's no anger. There's no anger at all. And there's forgiveness. He forgives his brother. He's not angry with them. He's not, he's, he understands that there was a divine plan. I'm not angry with you. I'm, don't bear a grudge. I forgive you. Like, I've let it all go. I'm moving on. Like, this is, has to be. But what, what really also has to be, there has to be brotherhood. How do I create brotherhood? And I heard um, a wonderful shia by a woman called Sivan Rahav Meir, who I recommend you listen to. So have, uh, Sivan Rahav Meir. And she talks about um, emotional intelligence, that Joseph, not only was he able to reframe the whole story, but he acted with supreme emotional intelligence. And um, the way that she uh, uh, de- um, uh, describes what emotional intelligence is, it's being self-aware. Okay, so this is for us. Like, how do we become emotionally intelligent? What is emotional intelligence? It's being aware, right? So we have to be aware of ourselves and our position in 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 the relationships that we have and in the things that happen to us. So be aware of your own emotions. Manage those emotions. 
maybe look at stand outside of them look at them are they are they are they helping or they're not helping can i regulate them am i able to self regulate my emotions so here's joseph and he sees his brothers in front of him and probably you 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 just want to I don't know what you want to do, but let's look and see what Joseph does. He doesn't reveal himself right away, right? He met them last week and he sends them back with food and he brings Benjamin down and then he sends them back with food and he frames Benjamin with the silver cup and then they come back and Judah is now given this position where he can do complete teshuva. Wait, let's finish with the emotional intelligence and come back to that. So self-regulate your emotions, channel your emotions to achieve the higher goals to have empathy, to understand the um, emotional life of the other person, to think about what it's like to be in their shoes. Like, who are these brothers now? Right? So they, th they threw and they sold Joseph way back. Joseph reframed it. Like, it had to happen. It had to be that way. Um, I forgive you for what you did. Right? I'm, but I have empathy. Like, why did you do that? What was it that caused you to do that? Like, how is he able to do that? And to then to manage the relationship to, in a smart way, right? So his goal, Joseph's goal, one is to bring out the dream that, 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 that this dream should, prophecy should come true. And also to create a unified brotherhood that they should be the, the brotherhood, the family that's going to be the ancestors, right? There are ancestors who are the beginning of the Jewish people. And when they go down into slavery, this is the beginning of the uh, Jewish people coming down to Egypt to begin their slavery that they had to have happen and then come out. So in order to survive that slavery, they had to be a brotherhood. They had to be united. They had to be responsible for each other. And Joseph is managing the situation such that Everybody comes around. Everybody does teshuva. Everybody understands that they played a role that that they that they that they regret that they. So let's go and talk a little bit about teshuva and look at how Joseph enacted that in the brothers, especially in Judah. Judah's the one who sells Joseph into slavery. Judah. We didn't talk about this last week, but in last week's Torah portion, there's an incident between. Um, Tamar and and um, and Judah. So Judah, I'm going to just very briefly tell the story. Judah, who is uh, obviously a son of Jacob and Leah, he has um, three sons, and uh, his oldest son marries a woman called Tamar. They don't have any children, and his oldest son dies. Then he has a second son. That second son marries the widow of the first son of the brother. It's called Yibum. It's like a Leverite marriage. He marries the, 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 the second, she marries the second son. They don't have any children. He also dies. So Judah doesn't really want to give his third son, who's a little boy, to Tamar. It's like, oh, well, if he marries, if he marries Tamar, he'll die too. So he doesn't, he doesn't, um, he doesn't, uh, want his third son, this young, this young son to marry Tamar. And uh, so he keeps stalling and stalling. And Tamar is anxious for the oldest son to have a child. So there will be there will be a, a legacy of the, of the oldest child. And so what she does is she sets up a scenario where she pretends she's a prostitute at the side of the road. And um, Yehuda, Judah, is walking by and he um, uses her services. And... Um, she, he wants to pay her and uh, he says oh, I don't have any money on me and she says just give me your cloak and your ring and your um, and your staff give me those three things and th that the zeo, that will be good so that's what he does and then it turns out that she's pregnant and it becomes known that Tamar the daughter-in-law of Judah is pregnant and so she must have done something out of wedlock so it's not it's not a good thing da 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 and they go they're going to kill her they're going to uh they're going to execute her for for her wrongdoing for her adultery and um as she's being brought out to be hung she says to Judah I need to talk to you and she says to him um I'm pregnant from whoever owns these three items and she produces the three items and Judah is now presented with a situation where he recognizes these items they are his items he is the father of um these children the, the twins in the Tamar's Tamar's pregnant belly that he he is the one who um impregnated Tamar and he has a choice and at that point is he going to do the right thing is he going to acknowledge that he is uh, that he is the, the father, that he caused this pregnancy? Is he going to um, acknowledge and um, own up? And he does. 
And that's huge. It's a huge step in the evolution of Judah that he could have said, no, that's not me. And then she would have got hung or whatever they were going to do to her. But he doesn't. He, uh, he takes responsibility. He takes responsibility and he says, yes, that's me. And this is who we're descended from. This man, Judah, who back a few, you know, a few Torah readings ago, back, you know, a few years ago, sold Joseph, his brother, into slavery. And now he's in this position where he's owning up to to um to causing to you know to uh to Mars pregnancy and now he's in this position where he's going to take responsibility for Benjamin right he understands that Benjamin is the beloved son of Jacob and he's not going to let his father down again he's going to acknowledge that he did what he did was wrong he's going to um regret what he did he's these are the steps of complete repentance of Jewish teshuva, right? It's acknowledging what you did. It's regretting and having remorse for what you did. It's committing to not repeating what you did. And when you are given the opportunity, you don't repeat what you, what you did last time. And Joseph is setting up a scenario to give a similar kind of an opportunity with the son of Joseph, with the son of Jacob, um, the son of Rachel, the other son of Rachel, Benjamin. And Joseph has given Benjamin lots of more, more gifts, more money, more everything than the other brothers. He's setting up a scenario of a potential jealousy where they could be, again, the brothers could be jealous of Benjamin because Benjamin received a lot more gifts from the grand vizier than the, than the rest of them did. He sets it up as close as possible to what happened before with Jacob and Joseph and how we have we have Benjamin and what's Judah going to do he's going to stand up he's going to be responsible for his brother and from this we learn the concept of responsibility of brotherhood this is here we are in almost 2020 in America where there's unbelievable amounts of anti-semitism as we all know going on and and we're responsible for each other we are all one family we're all brotherhood it's not those jews in muncie it's it's my brother in muncie or my sister in muncie it's us it's happening to each one of us we're all part of of this collective we're all responsible one for another and 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 it stems back to this it stems back to them, these brothers showing us the way of what unity is. What J when, Ju when, when Judah stands up and says, I'm taking responsibility. Don't put Benjamin in jail. I'll stand up for him. I'll take responsibility. Like I, uh. And um, that, at that point, at that point, Joseph recognizes that it's all like they've done complete teshuva. They are, com they are baal teshuva. They've done their complete repentance. They have, they have gone through all those stages through the, through the, 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 the story of the last few Torah readings of acknowledging, regretting, committing to not doing again, being off, being, being brought to an opportunity that was very similar to the um, scenario from before and acting differently because they're different people. They have changed. Judah is somebody who has changed. He's not the same person he was before. It's written into our Torah. It's written into our, into our essence that we have the capacity to change. That's, that's what it means. That's what Yom Kippur is all about. Like we go into Yom Kippur, it's like going into a mikveh. It's like going into some place where we can like shed all the parts of us that we don't want to, we don't want, and we can shed them and we can emerge from a place, a time, a, 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 a mental outlook um, into a new beginning, into a new future. That's what means to be able to do teshuva and the and Judah shows us that he has done that and at that point Joseph reveals himself and he says he says first of all he 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 gets all the Egyptians out of the way he says Egyptians leave and then he reveals himself to the brothers so so let's just go back so Vayigash is this coming close in order to so Judah's coming close to Joseph to say, don't, don't do this. Don't take this son. Don't take Benjamin. I'll go instead. He's coming close, right? So in order to really be in a relationship to someone, we have to come close to them. We have to like, know, you know, like, um, 
like share our hearts and share our minds and share our thoughts and that's how you come close to people like if from afar you don't know people but up close we know people when we were when we look into each other's eyes and we talk to each other a bit hard with telephones and all of that nowadays but that's what it's about coming close and and judah and comes close we have a few incidences in this week's torah portion where there's a coming together where there's a reconciliation there's brothers hugging there's brothers coming close to each other it begins with judah standing up for benjamin coming close to joseph how much courage must he have to do that this isn't in his mind this isn't joseph this is the vizier of egypt this is this high this high person is coming close and a lot of our commentaries say as much as Judah is coming close to, to uh, the Grand Vizier or to Joseph. It's a, um, it's a, it's a, uh, a metaphor for us coming close to God. Like when we take these three steps forward, we're coming close to God, right? Like, do we have the courage to come close to God? Can we bear our souls? Can we, can we like have the courage to do that? To say, yes, God's here and I'm coming close and I want to be close and I want that closeness and approach and approach him, approach him, God, approach you know, in the same way that Joseph is approaching the Grand Vizier. So, um, so there's this closeness. And then um, he, Joseph gets rid of all the extraneous people, all the extra Egyptians that are in the room. And at that point, he reveals himself to the brothers. And he says, um, he says, uh, ah, I don't know. He says, um, he, 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 here it is. Joseph says to his brothers, I need Joseph. I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? Okay, a lot to talk about. And his brothers could not answer him because they were left disconcerted before him. Can you imagine? You know, like they didn't know what happened to Joseph. They didn't know if he was killed. They didn't know what happened to him. And here he is the, in the most unexpected of places as the Grand Vizier who they're coming to to ask for food, to ask for, to ask for compassion, to ask, like, 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 don't, don't take our brother let's not do that because our father will not will not survive this and uh, and then he reveals himself as their brother and and actually in this week's toe portion uh, this and last week's toe portion joseph cries he cries over and over and over and over again jacob is weeping he weeps when he sees his brothers for the first time he weeps when he reveals himself to them, he, he cries when he um, reconciles and he has this emotional um, hugging incident with his brother, Benjamin. He cries when he meets his father and his father comes down. There's eight times in this week's Torah portion where he cries. And um, so our society perhaps isn't a society that recognizes the value of crying, of weeping. Um, so maybe we could just pause for a second and think about what weeping is and how important weeping is in our emotional toolbox. You know, if we hold in and we hold in, we hold in, where does that, where does that pain go? And sometimes the pain goes in the tears. They're a way of us releasing an emotional buildup that are, at an emotional buildup, where does it go? Where does it go? And, and it can be released through the tears. They kind of wash away some emotional buildup that we have, that they well up, I like this phrase, they well up from the deepest and frankest recesses of human emotion. They are our genuine feelings. Our heart, our heart is open and they, and, they, and they dig deep into the hidden recesses of our heart, like the shofar. Like a shofar is the blow, like some of the sounds of the shofar are like weeping, like, like they're, it's like a crying, it's like a wailing. There's, there's something that's or beyond words, that's hidden through sound or through tears that doesn't, that doesn't, that can't be contained in words and it comes out as a cry or it comes out as tears, it's deeper than words. And what Joseph is doing, and uh, like, is, is back to this emotional intelligence. I would posit that that the emotional intelligence that Joseph manifests isn't just in the way in which he manages his emotions by concealing them, by not telling his brothers who he is, but by weeping. That crying is a part of his emotional intelligence. That that when we when we allow ourselves to feel the feelings that we have, that we can move through them. It's almost like a a wave. There's a wave that kind of washes over us when we when we really cry and you really let it out. You know the grief, the grief of 
the grief of, of loss or the grief of, of, of regret or the relief of grief, all these things that, that the brothers must have been feeling, the grief of the father, the grief of the boys knowing that they sold their brother, the grief that Joseph must have felt when his brother sold him, not knowing where his father was, what role his father played in all of it. Why isn't anyone coming to look for him? Like all of this pent up emotion, like I can only imagine like how much weeping and crying. And it says, that some of the crying that Joseph did was so loud that the whole palace heard it even more than that. And even Judah in the Medrash is, uh, is known to have cried so loudly. He's so involved in the defense of the and the responsibility that he's taking for his brother Benjamin that he cries so loud it's, it's heard across the world. So um, I would just throw in there um, to meditate on perhaps or to think about the value and the um, positive outcome of crying and weeping and Joseph is our teacher of that in the many different places in which he cries in last week and this week. Okay so we've been through we've been through um, the divine providence of the whole story playing out the way it had to play out that Joseph who could easily have played made, excuse me uh, could easily have borne a grudge against his brothers could easily have been angry at them isn't angry he's forgiving of them he understands the divine plan he rewrote the whole of his past 22 years into a into a story of divine providence that god was involved here that it had to happen this way and that he's um tasked with reconciling the brotherhood that he's bringing everybody together that um and so we have so we have all of that and we have the crying and we have the changing um so ridding the room so it gets rid of all the it gets rid of all the extra egyptian people in the room just like um when tamar in the tamar and yehuda story when tamar is showing the items to yehuda she does it in private she gives him she gives him the the choice to not be embarrassed right she takes him she takes him and says here's the things right I don't, I, and you decide what you do and he uh, decides to own up he takes responsibility he takes responsibility and he owns up right and so he then 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 things move in a different direction she doesn't get killed etc um same here joseph is clearing the room of the egyptians and one of the reasons given is because he doesn't want to it's amazing. He doesn't want to humiliate his brothers. He doesn't want the Egyptians to know what his brothers did. He has the ability to contain his emotion, emotional um, proclivity to be angry and not be angry and to control himself and to be emotionally intelligent enough to, and to be empathetic enough to his brothers to clear the room so that the brothers are not humiliated in, humiliated in front of the Egyptians. So it's so interesting. There are there are three um, things that, as a as a um, a Jew, we are supposed to give our life up for murder. Um, you, you can't murder someone. You can't uh, commit adultery, and you can't uh, commit idolatry. These are things that we give our lives up for. But there's also humiliate. To humiliate someone is considered as if you have killed them. To humiliate, excuse me. <laughs> To humiliate someone is considered as if you have killed them, that we are enjoined to be very, very careful about how we speak to people and what we do so we don't humiliate other people. And in this week's Torah portion, we see it when Joseph clears the room of the Egyptians. That's him being empathetic and understanding that it's going to be humiliating to his brothers for him to reveal himself in front of everybody. So he clears the room and he's just now like here with his brothers. And I and another way in which that metaphor plays itself out is for us when we come into prayer with God the idea is to clear the room <laughs> right so the metaphor right so what Joseph did was he cleared the room of the Egyptians so that he could have this focused interaction with his brothers so too when we come close to God the idea is to be focused on our relationship to God, not to, to clear the room, to clear our minds of all this other stuff, all this extraneous noise, to clear clear the space so that we can just concentrate on this, which we are doing is coming close to God. So this coming closeness, so the coming close of Joseph to his brothers, get rid of the Egyptians, us coming close to God, get rid of all the noise in our minds, if we can do that. So that's another way that that parallels out. Okay, so um, 
so we have so now where do I want to go? So I want to go with the meeting between um the meeting between Benjamin and Joseph. So this is the, really the first time in all those years he was a little boy. Jo Benjamin was a little boy when Joseph was sold and gone. And um, this is his full true brother, the Joseph, the Joseph and the Benjamin coming together as the full um, siblings that they are, same parents, Rachel and Jacob. And they fall onto each other's necks and they cry. Both of them cry. And um, what's interesting is the idea of a neck. So in mystical teaching, the neck is the link between our head and our body, right? It's between our spiritual, our thoughts, our, our, our higher selves and our lower selves is the neck. That's the link between the higher and the lower, between the spiritual and the physical. So too, the neck is considered to be um, the uh, holy temple in Jerusalem is the neck linking spirituality with physicality. So in the same way that our neck links our head with our body, our spirituality with our physicality, that's what the role of the temple, the temple was the link, the temple was the neck that linked spirituality with physicality. So when Jake, when Joseph and Benjamin are falling in each other's necks, they're crying, and the commentators tell us what they're crying for is what's going to be in the future with the temples, with the necks that are going to build on their respective lands. So Benjamin is um, where the two temples in Jerusalem stand is Benjamin's land. And where, um, and where Joseph land is Shiloh, where the tabernacle, when they come out of Egypt and they go into Israel, they build the, 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 the tabernacle the Mishkan, the, the, the linking between physical, spirituality and physicality, they build that in Shiloh and it will be destroyed. And the crying of each one of them is, says our commentators, them crying about the destruction of the temples that will happen in each other's land. So when Joseph is crying on Benjamin's neck, he's crying for the two temples that we build, will be destroyed in the future on Benjamin's future land. And when Benjamin is crying on Joseph's neck, he's crying for the destruction of the tabernacle that will happen in Joseph's land in Shiloh. So what's interesting here is they're not crying, again crying, again neck, but they're not crying about their own loss. They're crying about the loss of the other. Joseph is crying for the loss that Benjamin will have well, in his will have in his future, and Benjamin's crying for the loss that Joseph will have in his future. And here again, maybe linking back to the idea of our responsibility for each other and our feeling each other's pain, da, 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 is this idea that that as much as I feel pain, I also feel your pain. And what Joseph and Je and Benjamin are feeling is, is each other's pain that they're they're crying over the pain that the other one will feel. So again, in our lives, we we know we cry for ourselves. We cry for each other. We cry. I cry for your pain, and uh, as much as I cry for my own pain, I also cry for your pain. Um, and I think we're feeling that a lot in uh, in in our in our Jewish world today. We're crying for the for the for the for the pain of our people. We're feeling it. We're feeling it. We're feeling it very deeply. So there's this crying. Later on in this week's Torah portion, we have the uh, the meeting of. Joseph and Jacob, right? So after all those years, Jacob's coming down. By the way, when Jacob comes down to Egypt, it says that all of Egypt comes out to meet him. There's this huge entourage of, of welcome for the father of the grand vizier is coming down to Egypt. And they all come out to greet him. And I and again, I want to heart, maybe it's my British sensibilities, but it's part of our Torah tradition that as much as we when we welcome guests and we see guests out and they're, 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 they're finished being visiting us and they're leaving, we go and we escort them out. There's also an idea of escorting people in that we don't just like leave the door open and, well, I leave the door open, but don't tell anybody that, but that you can walk in. But if somebody's walking into your house or somebody's coming to your house and knocking on your door, you go welcome them in. You go and you, and you escort them into your house. That shows you that you really want them, that it's important to you that they're here, that they matter to you, that it's important they're here. And so again, we see that from Joseph from Joseph and the way in which he greets his father. He goes to meet him. He goes to meet him. And how much more so should we go out to greet our guests when they come into our house? Okay, so this meeting of Joseph and his father 
right? So after all these years, and it's like, it's like it's almost hard to imagine, you know, you, even in our modern day where people, um, um, you know, re-meet Holocaust survivors who thought the other one was dead, and then like 30 years, 50, 40 years later, they meet their brother. There was a story about these two brothers who thought each one was dead, and they met on a bus in Jerusalem, like they happened to be on the same bus, like crazy stories. And you and you see someone you haven't seen or you didn't know was alive, or now with social media, you know, one brother went to Argentina and another brother went to Israel, and their children on social media find that their brothers are still, that these two, their fathers are brothers, and, and they didn't know about each other, they meet. I mean, there's unbelievable stories of meeting. In our day, can it, can't even imagine in, in back in this time where, where Jacob never gave up hope that his son was still alive and, and Joseph not knowing what's happened. And it's his father. He says, he says to his brothers, I'm Joseph. I'm Joseph. Right? Like, that's all he had to say. The brothers are like completely you know, guilt ridden and like, oh my gosh, you know, like, like now this is, this is you giving us um, rebuke, you're rebuking us. And, and they, but he didn't say anything. He just said, I'm Joseph. So they get the whole, the whole picture becomes clear and they're like, oh, oh, you know, oh, like and there's not, there's no words to describe like how they must have been feeling. And then he says, is my father still alive? Like, is my father still alive? On some level, Joseph is saying to himself, is my father still alive? Is he still part of me? Am I still connected to my father? Even though I'm in Egypt and even though I've been away from home and away from my father for 22 years, is my father still alive in me? Right. And actually, there's a medrash, there's a story that says that when he, Joseph cleared all the brothers, all the uh, extra Egyptians out of the room, that he takes his brother close and he shows them that he's circumcised. So there's a you know, so what's that about? So one is to one is to show you like I, I'm proving to you that I'm your I'm your brother. I'm I'm your brother. I'm showing you I'm circumcised, but also I'm showing you that I'm still linked. I'm still linked to the covenant. I'm still linked to our father. You know, Israel, Jacob. I'm still I'm still part of the Jewish people. I haven't let go. I've lived in Egypt, and I've got a different name, and I've got a different wife, and I've got you know children that represent I've my my desire to kind of push away my past the harshness and the sadness of my past, but I'm also still Joseph the brother, Joseph part of you, part of the Jewish people, part of the divine plan. I'm still Joseph who's in covenantal relationship with God, with the Jewish people. I'm still, that's who I am. So that's crazy, right? So, um, so when he, when he, when he says to his brothers, um, is my father still alive? Is my father still alive? Like, does he still have hope that he'll see me again? Is he being crushed by the weight of grief that has must have must have weighed down on him all these years is he still alive you know is there still life in Jacob and there is and he comes down and um, they meet and there's again there's a crying and again the language is a little different I don't I'm not going to read it inside because I don't have time but he says so Joseph cries the understanding is that Joseph cries when he sees his, when he hugs his father so they're hugging Joseph is crying again. Jacob's not crying. And the story, the commentary, tells us that Jacob is saying the Shema. He's taking the huge amount of emotion and joy and love that he has in his heart and he's directing it to God. As much as this is a moment of reconciliation and and father son reunion and i'm so i'm so relieved and i'm so inspired to see you and my ruach my 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 spirituality has reignited inside of me jacob understands that it's all god's plan and it takes all his emotional energy and instead of directing it at joseph he directs it to God and he says, Shema, he covers his eyes and he says, that's why we cover our eyes. Why do we cover our eyes when we say Shema Israel? We cover our eyes because what we see, we don't see the whole picture. So when we say God is one, we can't see it. We can't see it because it seems so fragmented to us. So we have to cover our eyes because, because it's not visible to us. Our world isn't a world where we can see the oneness of God, but we cover our eyes because we know it, because we have faith in it, because we understand it, but we don't see it. So we cover our eyes and we say, Shema Yisrael, listen, 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 know that God is one. Actually, by the way, just sidebar comment, 
the dreidel, as you know, the dreidel is like a spins and it spins on a point. And, it, and another way of understanding the dreidel is that the dreidel is like the world spinning. It's like the world spinning. What does it spin on? It spins on that little point and that little point is God. That's the, that it's spinning on God. It like all revolves around God. It's all going to happen the way God wants it to happen. That, 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 that spinning of the world is all predicated on God's involvement and where it lands and how it lands and where it travels to all under the direction of divine providence. So anyway, so God, so he's saying God is one. I, I didn't understand the whole picture. I didn't understand why I had to not know where you were. And I didn't, no, 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 And I'm not, but I'm so happy that you're here. And Hashem is Echad. And Hashem is one. God is one. And that's what he's saying. And he's, and he's proclaiming his faith in God. He's proclaiming the oneness of God, his love for God, his oneness, awesomeness of God. And he's accepting that the whole way it had to play out is all God's plan. It's a confirmation of his faith and um, and his um, faith in the future of the Jewish people and he never gave up and uh, that's that's what it says that he was doing that he was saying Shema he's not crying he's taking all that emotional energy and he's feeding it into his relationship to God and uh, that's pretty powerful like sometimes when we're very when we're very broken open and we're so sad and we lose you know we, we, we lose people or you know tragedies happen then we kind of beseech God and we reach out to God and we pray to God but when we're happy are we also doing that are we also taking the happy moments and the joyous moments and the, and the moments where 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 we're transported into a new realm and are we are we saying thank God you know but like really like to say Shema like it wasn't the time to say Shema it wasn't like Joseph should also be saying Shema Joseph already lived in exile Joseph already knew that he was in exile like he was beginning the descent of the Jewish people down to Egypt but so so maybe in his mind like his whole emotional intelligence was being directed towards his father but Jacob is not only um taking his emotion and connecting it to God, but he's also understanding this is also the beginning of the Jewish people coming to exile. This is the beginning of Jacob coming. Like Jacob's lived this whole time now, this last 20 years in Israel, and he's now coming down to Egypt. So he's coming down into exile. He needs the strength of Shema, of knowing the oneness of God. He needs that strength to be proclaimed in the world to start the exile of the Jewish people in Egypt. So that's why he's saying Shema. He wants to fortify the the, the the world. He wants to fortify his sons. He wants to fortify the Jewish people coming down to Egypt, that they shall have the strength to survive the enslavement that's going to ensue in Egypt. So he sang Shema to, to inject into the the, this into into their beginning of their exile this oneness and this connection to God. So um I want to bring a point from before. Sorry I didn't mention it before. So Joseph is incredibly kind to his brothers after all the machinations and making it and framing them and all of that. But now he's kind to them. He's going to set them up. He's going to set them up in Goshen, which is a, a part of the land of Egypt that's a little bit separate. So he's not the the, the Jewish people coming down or the Bnei Yisrael coming down, the children of Israel, the children of Jacob are coming and they're going to settle in a separate land called Goshen. Uh, so they're a little bit separate from the rest of the Egyptians, which is an important point. We'll come back to that. But he's kind to them. And it's um, back to the point of forgiveness that we spoke about before, how he forgave his brothers. He wasn't angry with them. And he repays, he almost repays their bad with good, right? They, were, they weren't nice to him. They, they spoke ill of him. They threw him into a pit. They sold him into slavery, right? So on his, on his end, he could definitely have been, you know, angry back and done all sorts of things and been revengeful. He wasn't any of those things. He was kind back. And uh, again, I want to pull out a Jewish value. We have a Jewish value um, that, or a Jewish understanding that the way in which this is really important, really, I want to say it right, that the way we treat other people is the way God will treat us. So if we are kind to other people, God will be kind to us. If we give the benefit of the doubt to other people, then God will give us the benefit of the doubt. If we go out of our way to, to do things for other people, if we, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, however we we function in the world is the way God will, will treat us. If we're mean and vindictive and, and revengeful and angry and we don't give the benefit of the doubt, then that's kind of like the, the way in which we'll be treated. And what Joseph is showing is um, that, that the best way is to act kindly, even if you're not being treated with kindness. 
It's hard to do, back to the emotional intelligence of Joseph, right? Of being in control of his emotions, etc., etc. But what kind of people am I? What, um, you know, are we? Like, who do we want to be? How do we want to express ourselves in the world? And yes, people push our buttons. And yes, people do things that are annoying. And da 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 But our job is to try to work on ourselves so we don't respond um, knee-jerk way. We don't, like, kick back because we're kicked. We don't um, speak back because we're being spoken badly. Like... Like to be, what kind of person do I want to be? Irrespective of how other people treat me, right? I, I have a right to be angry with you because you're angry with me. I have a right to be mean to you because you're mean to me. No, no, that's not the way, the Jewish way. The Jewish way, if we can do it right, is to say, however you treat me, even if you're mean to me, even if you're, you know, you're angry with me, even if you like cheat me, I'm not going to cheat you back. It doesn't give me license to cheat you or to be angry with you or to harm you or to be mean to you. Right. So that's an important point that, 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 um, that what I think my mother-in-law would say something like, um, you know, repay, repay with kindness, always repay with kindness. Like even if somebody's mean to you, just be kind, like the kind, you can't go wrong being kind, right, just keep being kind, like, people hold things back from you, then just give them, give them more, you know, go out of your way to be kind, um, so I think that's a good lesson to learn from Joseph, you know, Joseph is kind to his brothers, even though they threw him in a pit, and then, nah, nah, nah. like, he's orchestrating it so that they'll be Teshuvah, he's orchestrating it so that there'll be brotherhood, he's orchestrating it so that everybody will kind of, like, end up on top, right, in order to be the best brothers they can be, they had to go through all these steps to get to this place where they're able to connect on a really emotional, um, um, emotionally good place, and that's the end of this week's Torah portion, where they're kind of like, they're united, there's a unification and a reconciliation of the brotherhood brought about by Joseph, and not only orchestrating things so that there's an ability to do repentance like we spoke, but also that he's always kind. He's always like looking looking for the, the the relationship to be managed for good for everybody. Like there's an empathy for the other, there's a kindness for the other. So let's put that in there. Um, at the point, I just want to bring up one more point before I end. At the point where Judah steps in for Benjamin and he says, you know, I'll I'll don't, 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 don't take Benjamin as a slave. I, I, the, 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 our father will die if I don't bring Benjamin back. So this father-son relationship, Benjamin and Jacob, right? So this old Jacob lost Joseph, doesn't know where Joseph is at this point. And now there's the potential for losing his other second beloved son of his wife, Rachel, the only other son he's going to lose. And so our father will die. Our father won't be able to survive. So interesting, the relationship between children and parents. So this is predicated on, so the fact is that Benjamin apparently had 10 children. Judah doesn't say to Joseph, you know, don't take our brother Benjamin because all of his children will miss him. <laughs> all of the children of Benjamin will mourn the loss of their father. He doesn't evoke the children of Benjamin as reason to not take Benjamin hostage or a slave. He only harps on the father. The father's the important person, not the children. Meaning, perhaps, I don't know, we could you know, think about this, but the implication is that parents have a great love for their children. Children might need their parents, but the love, perhaps, perhaps, goes parent to child more than child to parent, more than the child loves the parent, the parent loves the child. So I don't know, that's that's what the, this is predicated on, this idea of why it was that Benjamin, don't take Benjamin because the father will die, the father, the father will die, the father loves the child so much that to lose another child be just too much, can't bear that, can't live without that, rather than the child, the children of Benjamin needing their father, it goes the other way. So perhaps, Perhaps the love for, for perhaps I'm throwing it out there. Discuss the the child. The parent has greater love for the child than the child has for the parent. So that's maybe another idea. Um, okay, I think I've said everything I wanted to say. There's a lot more to say, um, but um, let's just wrap it up because we're getting to the end of the hour. So so here we have this love 
this love is I think this is a Torah portion of love it's a Torah portion about repentance it's a Torah portion of reconciliation of brotherhood of responsibility one for the other it's um, emotional intelligence of of being able to cry being able to um, orchestrate things to manage the relationship so that we reach a higher more intimate relationship with each other it's um, a, a Torah portion of the playing out of divine providence it's a Torah portion of forgiveness and empathy and and not being angry and not humiliating other people being able to understand that certain actions I might have might humiliate someone so I don't do them um, acting with kindness above all, even if you're not treated kindly, of proclaiming the oneness of God, of saying Shema, of, of the relationships between people, um, and coming close, the coming closeness, right? So at the beginning when we spoke about uh, the brothers seeing Joseph from afar, you know, like being close, coming up close, like Vayiga, she comes close to him. And we come close to each other, we get to know each other, we get to understand each other, we get to we get to see that in the life, like you can't, it, most times we understand that you can't hate someone you actually know, right? Let's like, get to know each other, let's understand each other's inner lives, let's get to know our own inner lives so we can share who we are with other people and um, and, and come close to each other and, uh, not, uh, and not see each other as distant, as afar. And uh, so when we do see each other up close and we understand who we all are, that we will achieve a more, um, a more peaceful and a more uh, love-filled world. And uh, we definitely need that in our days. So um, wishing you all a peaceful and a meaningful and um, 2020 with relationships that are, um, that are, that are, that are sustaining and that uh, help us to be the best that we can be in this world.